with our friends out there live. in streaming land. Well, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Crosby Kemper. I'm the director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services of the federal government, the federal support for libraries and, and museums. Uh, and this is the second in a series of conversations on the arts and humanities in libraries and museums about the shared heritage, the shared ideals, and the shared experiences that we all have or perhaps could have. Today, I'm honored and pleased to have my friend David Thompson, America's, well, maybe the world's best film critic, uh, uh, with us. Uh, he's written The Whole Equation, oops, there's a, a, you know, audio visual supports here, uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the Big Screen, uh, and these are, the t I think, the two best books about Hollywood and the world movie uh, experience and, and history, the whole story of the movies, uh, as well as he's written a, a, a group of recent books uh, about terror, sex, murder, uh, and the other reasons that we go to the movies. All the good stuff. So, yeah, there we go. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll talk about Hollywood's legacy and what is worth preserving and promoting, what's really good, what's worth watching, and especially what's worth watching again. So first, the existential question for you, David. Uh, yeah. The pandemic, yes. technology, the virtual thing that we're all doing, streaming, et cetera. Will the film industry, the movie theater, the theatrical release, the big screen, survive? I don't know. Uh, I was talking only the other day with a friend who is a fairly important distributor of films in this country, and we agreed. We don't know the answer. Uh, I think a lot of people feel a really profound urge to get out into a theater, uh, a live theater, maybe even more than a movie theater. But while we've had a great time in our living room watching shows that we've binged over, and I think that's been a huge experience, um, we want to get back to what we think we had. And that, I think, is basically sitting with a crowd of strangers, laughing or being frightened by the same emotion coming off the screen, a big screen. And that is what I think we still think of as the experience of cinema, movie going, whatever you call it. One has to say factually, that that experience has been in decline for quite a long time before COVID. Um, if you go to a theater, or if, if you went to a theater just two years ago in the afternoon, uh, you were in pretty small company. And a lot of those theaters did not even play in the afternoons. They had resigned themselves to just playing in the evening. So we have to face the fact that commercially, many movie theaters were in bad shape before COVID came along. And obviously, it's been a terrible experience for them after COVID. Well, it, it's a the, the, yeah, go, go on. I was well, just going to say, you talk about the experience, and, and, and the experience of the movie theater with a crowd is different than anything anything else. I can I can remember uh, going to the opening night of Jaws uh, right. in, a, in a, right. a neighborhood theater in Hamden, Connecticut. I walked a long way from downtown New Haven to get there, and I remember the very first time the shark seems to appear, everyone in the theater, 200 people, took their breath in. Yeah. And since we all did it at the same time, we all then laughed. And it was an incredible, uh, yeah. unifying experience uh, that that I uh, that I had that that night, and, and I, I miss that. I think everybody of a certain age does miss it, and and the real question is, is that kind of experience going to come back as a whole thing, and last, or 
have we moved on in terms of how we define the experience of watching films? And I'm not sure of the answer. I do think that watching streamed shows has had an extraordinary effect on us because you have all the advantages of a domestic setting. You actually have, for many people watching at home, you have a screen quality, a brightness of image, a detail that is more than you would get in a movie theater. And I think people are very impressed by that emotionally. And also the way it works economically, you feel you're just turning your television set on, you're renting a film for maybe three or four dollars. And you remember that if you took your friend, your wife, whatever, your husband, to a movie, you're probably getting into the region of a $40 bill if you include right. car parking and babysitting maybe. Um, it To watch the stuff at home seems cheaper. I'm not sure that it is, but it seems cheaper. The other thing is, I think we've all fallen in love with binging when we get a show we really love. So my wife and I. Right. So, so what are you watching now? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're we're watching a show called The Investigation at the moment, which is a, a Danish show. But I was thinking about Babylon Berlin. Uh, when we first found that, we just went on and on into the early hours of the morning, which is way beyond our bedtime. Um, watching maybe five episodes a night. And I don't think that's unusual. I think people change their habit of viewing. And that old fashioned serial right. sensation, what's going to happen next? Um, binge watching of long form television series has catered to that. And some of them, not all of them by any means, but some of those shows are really so good that they challenge the quality of what we've been seeing in a movie theater. This, the, Scandinavian, the Scandinavian detective series, uh, such as The Investigation, there are a whole bunch yes. of them that, that, that yes. seem of a remarkably high uh, quality. And I'm also I mean, going for, back to some of the BBC series. For many people, I think they had never seen a Danish or a Swedish show, because, you know, there aren't right. that many that play in America right. nowadays. And all of a sudden, you're getting hours of it. And um, it's very intriguing. And you learn a lot about these Scandinavian societies. So all I'm saying is that a change has occurred. And while I'm certain that once we feel safe, there will be a rush back to movie theaters, I'm not certain how long it will last. And in part, that's because I don't know if the movie industry knows how to make films that will rival the quality of the best long form TV series, because, you know, they're more grown up than a lot of movies. They're dealing with character and social reality in ways that movies are scared of dealing with now. So the, I think the, the industry, to the extent that it still exists, is facing huge challenges and questions. And I just don't know how it's going to turn out. So I'm, I'm interested in, 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 in that because it does seem to me that there was a, a golden age about five to 10 years ago of uh, television uh, production uh, that included The Wire and Breaking Bad right. and uh, Mad Men, uh, yep. et cetera. Um, it, it was really extraordinary, and I've sort of been waiting for that to happen again. There have been some interesting things, and particularly some in interesting shorter versions of that uh, uh, th that have that have come out. Uh, but but we I I haven't seen, and it's one reason I've been watching the Scandinavian shows uh, and the British shows. I haven't I haven't seen Hollywood turn out. Uh, you know they're back to producing some of the 
uh, the weekly shows, which are not terrible, and, and we've been watching some of them too, uh, but nothing at the quality of you know, the five to 10 years ago, at least my view. I share your view, and I think it's a reflection of a, a loss of confidence in Hollywood. I don't think Hollywood really quite believes it exists in the old way any longer. And you know, in my childhood, I went to the movies twice a week. I didn't even know what the movie was. I just went because I loved the, the relationship between the fantasy, the huge screen, the packed theater. It, it was for, for me, and I think for many people, it was the most important communal experience I had. Going to a soccer match would rival it, but there is an intensity from being in the dark that is greater than the open air. And I remember feeling the sheer excitement of watching a funny film and everybody laughing. And there was a kind of joy in that, you know what I mean? And it, it applies to dramas and adventure films too. And I, I thank my lucky stars that I grew up and sort of came of age in that climate. And when I think about my kids and grandkids, um, I don't think the cinema, the movies means the same to them. And I remember being intensely moved by stories in movies, moved to tears by them. And when I talk to my grandchildren, they're very blasé about being moved. They, they, they no longer believe that they go to the movies to believe in an intense dramatic situation. They've got a rather detached camp-like attitude to it because they, they believe the movies are fake. And I'm not saying they're wrong. I think they are. But I think once upon a time, we, you and I, near enough the same sort of age range, we trusted the movies. We trusted those stories and being immersed in them. I think that has rather passed. And, and it's, it's a reflection of huge questions like why people feel they're alive and what they're doing. What are we, what are we aiming for? I, I wanted to be happy when I was a kid. And I believe that there were evident ways that I could get to be happy and part of a productive society. I'm afraid people of my grandchildren's age don't have that conviction and trust anymore. Now, we're talking here about enormous issues and the cinema is a very small part of it, but I think it's been affected deeply by the larger thing I'm talking about. It, I, I completely agree with you. I think the trust in institutions is an example of that. Yeah. And it's, one reason that, that I, I'm glad we, we started on this subject, because I think there are very few trusted institutions. Libraries are, are, are one trusted institution and museums to some, some extent uh, as, as well. Uh, but, but we lost trust in institutions. And, and I think you're right, trust in Hollywood, trust in, in, the, in the movies. And, and also a sense of, uh, we have a sense of oppression. I say we, I, I think this is socially uh, uh, broadly uh, true though I think there are lots of pockets where it isn't true, that we, we, we feel, uh, we've gone from feeling life was an adventure, many of us, to feeling life is an oppression, uh, which is a sad commentary on our, on, on our world. And, and the movies have followed along with that. We, that as recently as only, only maybe a decade or two ago, two decades ago, probably, Indiana Jones was a, our, our most popular character uh, and probably yeah. all of, of, of the fictional world. Uh, yeah. and a great sense of adventure. I know you, you and I might dispute a little bit about the quality of, of Spielberg's view of the uh, of the world, but uh, but the Indiana Jones movies were fun, and yeah. and they were a sense of adventure. And it's hard to find anything that has a sense of adventure anymore in the yeah. Uh, yeah. in the movies. 
Um, yeah. and, people, and, and then the, go ahead. Go on. Well, I was going to say that stories, the people who write stories and the actors no longer feel they can be heroes in the same sort of way. And, you know, Indiana Jones made some fun of himself. But you trusted that guy's ability, his nerve, his courage, and and there was something admirable about him. And Harrison Ford is one of those actors that I think universally people said, I like Harrison Ford. He's a good guy. I sort of trust him. Whether they could or should have done that is another matter. But they did in the way that people had once trusted John Wayne. There aren't actors like that anymore, and that reflects the, what we're talking about, the, the loss of faith in the whole process of fantasy storytelling that movies introduced. And, and, and maybe in character, I mean, of course, some of it is we, we, we've, we, we have the revelations about everybody's private life, including those great actors of the past, whether it's Cary Grant right. or Gary Cooper or John Wayne. John Wayne didn't go fight in World War II, though, of course, Jimmy Stewart did. Yeah. Um, so maybe we could watch Jimmy Stewart movies anyway. I so know, we, I know. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you, you wonder why somebody like George Clooney, you, you talk a little bit about Clooney in, uh, in, in, in your books, uh, in more recent books. You know, he seems to have the charm and the grace of a Cary Grant. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And, and he's made one or two movies that have, that achieve that level. It seems to me, yeah. but only one or two. And then, and then, you know, it's hard to even remember some of some of the uh, of the movies. Well, you Maybe know, bad choices, but no, no. I mean, it's very tough to be George Clooney or a George Clooney-like figure today. Um, a year and a half ago, whatever it was, two years ago, uh, when I saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, a film over which I have mixed feelings, there is a moment in that film where Brad Pitt goes up on a, a roof in a Beverly Hills home to repair the TV antenna, I think. <laughs> and he takes off his shirt because it's a beautiful day and he's going to be working. And all of a sudden, I felt, and I felt other people in the audience have the same feeling, of, oh, wow, that is one guy. You know, I think Bradford at the time was over 50, and he looked a lot younger, and he's an example, I think, of someone who has managed to get up on screen and say, I'm going to be your hero, without irony, without shame about it, without feeling camp and pulled it off. But it's a hard thing to do. It's equally hard for a young woman or a woman to come on screen and to look at us without knowing we're there, the way you look at the audience in a film and say, you know, I have one sexy broad because one sexy broad has become an extremely problematic category. and. It's very hard for actresses to do that straight because they don't want to encourage the archetype of one sexy broad because it represents a past. Now, there we're touching upon a cultural hangover that really is dogging the movies. They no longer know, I think, how to treat relationships between men and women. Uh, and the assurance that it had for decades about that. He's good looking, she's good looking, of course they're gonna come together. It's not believed in anymore. It's not just that divorce broke down the sense of what that man and woman will do together. It's that romantic confidence has gone and it it's a it, it's an it's another way of saying that it's fatuous to say make america great again because america is a wonderful place i chose to come here but a nation does not need to be great it needs to be decent and it needs to survive and the movies i think bred in us 
a feeling of supremacy, of prowess and accomplishment. And attached to that was the feeling that men ran the world. And if men ran the world, then they must take responsibility for making a god awful mess of it. And we no longer buy into those archetypes. And we're not sure what we're going to work our way through to. And there's a lot of anxiety about it, I think. And the funny thing is that although Hollywood thrived in the era of depression and war, it didn't have anxiety. You went exactly. to the movies, exactly anxiety. You went, you went to the movies in the first years of the Second World War. And you know, the world was in enormous peril. And somehow what you were seeing made you feel good about it. You know, I mean, some of the great press and circus films like The Lady Eve, Howard Hawks is His Girl Friday, were made during the war. They ignored the war. But by doing that, they sort of said to us, you can ignore the war. It's going to be all right. It, we're going to come through. I don't think we are sure we're going to come through now. So, and, and, I, and you've just picked two, two of our mutual favorite movies, The, the, yes. the Lady Eve and His Girl Friday. And, and I, I, I wonder why those movies, have, among other things, they, they have very strong women uh, in, in the movies. I mean, Barbara Stanwyck as the, the Lady Eve Sidgwick, et cetera, uh, and, uh, and Catherine Hepburn, uh, sorry, uh, in His Girl Friday, Rosalind Russell, and then there are some other similar movies at a similar time, The Philadelphia Story with Catherine, Catherine Hepburn, um, the, the, those comedies of remarriage, which you've, you've, uh, you've written, written about, uh, in, in which men and women are very anxious about each other. You know, Jimmy yes. Stewart in, in The Philadelphia Story is very anxious. Um, the, the whole relationship, uh, the triangular relationship uh, in His Girl Friday uh, between Cary Grant, uh, the editor, the Hildy, the reporter, and Ralph Bellamy, who comes on as the, the poor, poor end of that triangle. Uh, triangle. Yeah. Um, there, there's a, an immense amount of anxiety. Hildy, of course, has a lot of anxiety because she knows exactly what Walter, her ex-husband, is up to. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, uh, and why can't we why can't we deal with our anxiety that way and knowing knowing that the, the world is a slippery place knowing that there's anxiety out there and just being strong enough to take it and and to, and to give it back to take it and to give it back which is what those movies are about well i i think some of it has to do with the way in which men and women to take just two branches of the sexual tree, men and women now <laughs> feel a lot of collective unease and regret and envy and hostility about how they might be together. Um, we're not confident of what's going to happen to us in a, quote, relationship. Uh, we feel that relationships are much less stable than they seem to be in the Hollywood that loved happy endings. And we're working it out. And, and you know, uh, there are an increasing number of ways of working it out. And um, they, have, they have liberated our society in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, for, for instance, I think same-sex marriage is a very liberating force. And, I think it's, quote, a good thing. But I know that it is one of the things that most animates and provokes the kind of people who broke into the Capitol on January the 6th, just to generalize that group of people. And these tensions in our society, they have to do not just with how much money you have and whether you have a gun or not, they have to do with what your attitude to sex, to living together, to happiness, what those ideas are. And we're much more confused. Now, in the long term of history, it may well be that in 100 years or so, a great historian begins a book by saying, at last, in the second decade of the new century, the 21st century, 
America at last discovered the need to feel uneasy and had to have less confidence in itself. And from that moment onwards, the quality of the country began to improve and the cult of greatness gave way to the generality of decency. I would hope that a book like that will appear and that it will reflect a real enlightenment. We're at that point. We have to go one way or the other. I think we have to become more liberal or much less liberal. And it's quite evident in, the, in our society how easily we could go either direction. Well, we should certainly become more liberal in the sense of, of uh, civil society, of having a civil society, uh, civility being a core to, to a civil society. And we've kind of run out of that. And I think that, the, you know, the, the worst example is certainly the insurrection at, at the Capitol. But there, yeah. there, there, are, example, there are examples all, all over, including on, on the other, other side. Um, I, I, do, I do hope you, you would agree that the, the possibility of greatness, the possibility of uh, of, of heroism, it, it seems to me. That, take for instance the civil rights uh, movement. Uh, that that it, it took heroism uh, to. It, it may be. It may take heroism for us to get back to to making good movies. I don't know, but uh, the, it, it took some heroism to get to where we are today. And it may take some heroism of one kind or, or, or another for, for us to, to bring people together around certain common ideals. Um, it, it, being civil is a start, though. I, 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 in, in that sense, liberalism, the traditional liberalism, is, is absolutely uh, necessary and wanting today. Yeah, well, I mean, I think to be heroic is a wonderful aspiration because it, it implies that you oppose yourself to some force that disagrees with you, and you are prepared to out-argue it, to demonstrate other ways. And I think that's admirable. I have to say, and I think this is where I'm still European and English, I don't really know what national greatness is. Um, and I certainly don't trust it when it is a self-conscious ambition in a society. I mean, we may look back on the time of the Romans and say that was a great civilization. It was, based on, it was founded partly on slavery and many things we don't approve of, but they did great things in the world. But I'd much rather we told them through history that they had done great things than that they said at the time, we're doing great things. Because the only examples I know of people saying that in the present moment are essentially fascist operations. That's very frightening, I think, when that I think becomes... Over, my, my sense is that's an, that's an overstatement unless you take a very, some very small groups, the, you know, the, the, the Oath Breakers or the, the, the Boogie Boys. Um, the, uh, it, it, it does seem to me that that there is a heroism that we that we do need that's reflected in in some figures in our history and uh, and, and 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 some movies about them. So take take Lincoln for instance, and take yeah. uh, not only Spielberg's Lincoln with Daniel Day Lewis, but but uh, Ford's uh, Young Mister Lincoln, yeah. Um, yeah. which are both I think very good very good movies. Not Ford's absolute best uh, and maybe close to Spielberg's best with, with yeah. Lincoln. Um, and, 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 and they're about, they're about people who protected uh, what is good. L let's, let's forget greatness for a moment because of its connotations, nationalism versus patriotism, for instance, but protected what was good uh, in, in this country and what was good in this country at the beginning of the country and in the civil war where, you know, 300,000 white people were willing to die to end slavery. Uh, it, and, you know, it's more complicated than that, I recognize. But defending that, which Lincoln did, um, and, and expressing our, our care for that, as Spielberg and Daniel Day-Lewis did, seems to me something that is worth um, uh, celebrating about the movie business and about, about who we are.
Well, I no, I agree with you, and I mean, I I like both those films very much. However, um, isn't there a way that we need to say, draw a breath? We fought the Civil War, and if you like, right and justice won the Civil War. We marched across the bridge with John Lewis. We 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 suffered through civil rights with people being assassinated, and we got civil rights, which is an extraordinary, benevolent, wise piece of legislation. But we are still a deeply racist society. In other words, there is still, I think, in most white people, a discomfort with people of color. And that has got to be dealt with. And I don't think it's the responsibility of the movies to deal with it. A, I think we have been dealing with it for a long time and movies have been dealing with it too. I mean, you know, a lot of us individually and Hollywood in, you know, sort of sad, sappy liberalism ways like, you know, guess who's coming to dinner. Um, uh, but, you know, much more heroically, if you will, you look at look at the Oscars this year. Um, we, we, you know, I think I think we, we are coming to terms with it. And I think I think attitudes have changed dramatically. And, you know, it, it is true throughout history that people have always been afraid of uh, and oppressive of things that are different uh, than that, and people who are different than they are. And we're, we're doing, I think we're doing okay, David. I mean, it, compare us to the Chinese where they've got 10 million Uyghurs in uh, what are functionally, con you know, they've recreated the gulag or the concentration camps uh, in, in China. And, you know, Vladimir Putin, who, you know, if you raise your voice uh, uh, against him at dinner, you, f you know, you find yourself dead the next day. Um, et cetera, et cetera. We could go around the world. I think still we're, we're actually doing okay in that regard. We're not perfect. That's for sure. That's okay. for sure. And, and we need to do more for sure. But we're, well, it's not like, you're just saying we're like, racist strikes me as, as, as uh, being a, a little heavy. Well, perhaps it is. We're but less racist it, than we were. Yes, I think so. But I think it is still there. And I had a conversation of a few weeks ago with Spike Lee, who is an absolutely engaging and wonderfully smart guy and, um, you know, a great career. I think it's not unfair to say that Spike Lee believes the world now is as racist as the one into which he was born in the 1950s. Um, I don't think it's enough anymore for people like you and me to say, we're working hard at it and we're doing okay. Because if you look at what has happened in the last few years, just the last few years in this country, in matters of race, it doesn't look okay to me. It really doesn't. And I think that it's, easily conceivable that within the next few years, the extreme right wing would come back into power with a vengeance. And this country might then be almost compelled to refight the civil war. Maybe you now, think that's- well, I, I can't dramatic. disagree with you too, uh, possibly more on, uh, on that subject. And uh, so again, I mean, I would I would take you, you look, look uh, at at the Oscars. Look at the racial protests. So we had the racial protests, and what was the nation's reaction to the racial protests? Put aside the the, the violence that occasionally accompanied them. The racial protests, I, I think, were an inflection point. I think I think the, the majority of people in in the, in the country thought that understood what was going on in the racial protests. You know, you can argue about Black Lives Matter this way or that. But that the racial protests themselves against the, the the police killings and other aspects of racism in the country seemed to me to to be a, a a very important moment in our history. And then if you look around at what's going on in in terms of the movements towards racial racial justice, I think they're they're pretty strong in the country. Now you've you've got the insurrectionists and and you you know you've got 
Donald Trump occasionally retweeting white supremacist stuff and and whatnot. And that, but I think that's an outlying thing. Uh, I, I don't think that's a, there's a wave of uh, of that going on, except uh, you know uh, uh, the, the the Trump tweeters, um, uh, which which is you know which is a problem. Absolutely, is a problem. It needs to we we all need to reject that. Um, but but I, I I I see I see the wave going the other way. Look, at I, least I from a racial you, point of view. I hope you're right, and I'm encouraged by a lot of things that are happening too. But why is it that people of color are finding it much harder to get a vaccine? And why is it that they are dying in unusually high proportions? from COVID. How has that happened if we've been working at this and doing well, and it's pretty well okay? You see, I love the country, and please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I love the country, but I think the country is on the cusp. And I think the battle simply to be decent seems to me to be more important the aim of being great. I come from a country, pretty good country, fairly good record in a lot of respects, a stupid country in other respects. But even when the Second World War was concluded, and it would be possible for Britain to say, well, we won, as opposed to losing, um, I don't think anyone I knew felt it was necessary for the country to be great. I don't know what great means ultimately in that sense. I think being so, alive is more than great. You, do you know what I'm meaning? Yeah, well, I, I absolutely know what you mean. And, I, and so I'll say two things. One, I, I completely agree with you that I think being alive is great. And I think one of the great things about the movies historically has been uh, we go through various individual movies. If you wanted to, it is it frequently is about the joy of living. It, yes, it's about the joy of 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 participating in in certain things. And I was going to go into a, a riff about the difference between God, 1939 between Victor Fleming doing Gone with the Wind and Victor Fleming doing The Wizard of Oz, and yes. and why The Wizard of Oz will be a joy for everyone forever and gone with the wind now has to be interpreted uh to, yeah. to be on, on tv for good reason the reasons yeah. we've just been talking yeah. about um yeah. but, but 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 i want to i want I, there's a word you used and you use it in your books and it's pro a profoundly important word and i think it's the word allegiance and to have allegiance to anything we have to believe in it in some way now i, I you know you and i probably don't disagree much about the problems of nationalism national you know what th those of us who are old enough who, who or who saw enough world war ii movies or world war one movies or have read enough history know that nationalism can be a huge problem and nationalism has existed for a very long time and and it's pretty much existed in one form or another uh, ethnocentrism however however you want to put it almost everywhere in 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 history it has existed and in much worse forms than anything we see in the united states today but it's but it's problematic for sure but we have to find some kind of allegiance and it's why patriotism is important and it's why having good figures 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 that that we care about you know the great man theory of history may may may, may absolutely be wrong and, and and fallacious and particularly if taken over by nationalists as in german history it was for instance but if if, if we can have people like a george washington or an abraham lincoln a martin luther king uh, who, who represent our country and the greatness of our country. Allegiance to that, allegiance to what they represent seems to me something that's unifying in a good way for the country uh, and, and can take us a long way. And if we look at if we look at if we look at patriot, if we confuse nationalism and patriotism, and on the right, we've done that in a bad way. My my people have done that in a bad way in the last 20 years. But if on the left we can we confuse patriotism with nationalism and we reject any form of allegiance to the country particularly our country which has done so much good in, in the history of the world i think we've got a problem there i agree with everything you've said 
Uh, and uh, I, I think that those ideals are so important. I would say the two main things that people have allegiance to today are one, technology, and two, survival. And I think that a lot of people believe in their heart of hearts that the problems we face, and they go all the way from, say, racism and poverty to what is going to happen through our climate. <clears throat> I think a lot of people actually believe it's hopeless. And I think they have settled on making their time, their remaining time, as good as it can be, as comfortable as it can be. And I find it fascinating how that urge to be comfortable is enormously accelerated and assisted by technology. And I think right. there are many, many things in our lives where we have actually voluntarily abandoned qualities of human contact because the technology seems like the more rational and economic way of conducting our life. In other words, to really put it in a nutshell, a huge nutshell, there is a battle underway already between moral intelligence, by which I mean the ability to hold complicated ideas in your head in an effort to make the lives of as many people as possible better and artificial intelligence, which is the logic and the rationale of technology and which could, could smother moral intelligence. And, you know, we're talking huge lofty stuff here. Somehow we got away from the movies. Right, right. yeah, we got we gotten away from the movies. Let, let me let me ask you uh, this question to get back to the yeah. movies, but to take your yeah. point you, you you've just made. Um, I, I do think technology separates. It's one reason I think the community programs that libraries and museums do are so important. They bring people together, and in yeah. the pandemic we haven't been able to do that. And, but uh, there's a movie that you and I both love, and and in which a decision is made. Uh, that basically is, it's a decision about comfort in one way, but it's a decision about what I would call communal values that, that, that I think we're talking about. Meet Me in St. Louis, I'm thinking of, the musical. And, and, and you're very eloquent on this in a couple, a couple of your, your books um, uh, about the decision that the father makes uh, to, uh, to uh, not take the leap in his career and go to New York and the corporate headquarters um, and to stay uh, w with the great family. Now, of course, you know, any family in America would love to live in the house. Uh, they live in, uh, in <laughs> Louis. It's not exactly, he's not exactly abandoning comfort. That's for sure. It's a, it's a sweet life they have there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. But, but it's a, it's a very sentimental movie and of the kind that it's very hard to make today. And it's basically about family values, which everybody claims to be in favor of, and nobody really, uh, supports the, uh, these days, left, right, or center. Um, and I, I, I do think that the, the notion of community is so is so deeply important. And, and for a long time, people on the right were all about being Tocquevillians and Burkeans and and, uh, and and celebrating the, the community. Uh, and, and and social justice warriors on on the left have claimed to be all about that. And where, where I see community happening is in places like public libraries and and at the local level where people come together to do things and to have fun. Uh, have fun or do some good, and 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 it's it's one reason I, I I wanted to do this program with you is I thought you know if if we could recreate in libraries and sometimes in museums I know museums that are doing doing this the old film society idea you know when yeah. when you and I were 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 young and going to five movies a day there were lots of places to see older movies and classic movies and the kind of movies that like Meet Me in St Louis that are about values that are different than some of the values that are being celebrated in movies today. Um, and I wonder if we couldn't, we couldn't inspire ourselves uh, in libraries and, and museums with some, some great movies of some older movies and some newer well, movies and interpreting some, some challenging movies. 
I, I mean, I think that libraries, museums, schools are one of the greatest, most encouraging, welcoming aspects of this country and many other developed countries. And uh, I, as a kid, owed a lot to libraries and, and still do. Um, I love them. But here's a point. In the, in the realm of movies, we are at a point now, very close to it, where anyone who's got uh, access to the platforms that are available, and I'm not minimizing what that costs, but still, most of the country has that access, and that gives them the ability virtually, and I mean virtually in the old sense, to dial up any movie they want to see. Um, most of the films you and I have been talking about or could be talking about it in the program at the moment, we could, we could go home and dial them up. And that technology is extraordinary and wonderful. And you and I remember an age where if you hadn't seen a film, you might have to wait years to find it in a movie theater because there was no access to films in this kind of form. Um, in a way, that technology has already surpassed the library that has shelves of shelves of DVDs. It's wonderful that they do because you could go to the library and you can find a precious rare film as a DVD. However, when you get home, can you play it? Because the DVD player and the ability to service and repair a DVD player, that is fading away. And more and more, we depend on people like Netflix and Amazon to have the films we want to see. And they're corporations. They run by business logic. And what that means is you can't be sure that they will always have the films you want so that if I want to see the shop around the corner, a classic for the moment, I can see it now, but it's possible that in 10 years time, Netflix will tell you, or a version of Netflix will tell you, oh, we discontinued the shop around the corner because there wasn't sufficient demand for it. Because most young people haven't heard of it don't know who Ernst Lubitsch was and find it rather strange to see two people spending an hour and a half talking at cross purposes as to whether they're in love or not, because that's not the way people today really talk and behave. Now, the technology is changing the way we think about ourselves. And I think that's generally alarming i suspect you do too yeah i do that's why i'm suggesting and, al alternatives yes no absolutely and and you know i i want you to be back in libraries and i want to be and i want uh, millions of people to be in those libraries using them and of course there are more imaginative ways of using them than any of us have yet thought of and you are a, a forerunner and a very important figure in pioneering the whole sense of how can we make libraries relevant and active and important. And I've seen your library in Kansas City. I know the kind of things you did. And I now know that you're sort of taking responsibility for the libraries of America. And that's a great thing. No one, we couldn't hire a better person for that job than you. Uh, but the technology is insatiable and people love technology and they simply do not know how to stop it for instance go back 200 years or more the photograph comes into being and the photograph is so beguiling and so seductive and so entertaining that everybody wants it 
And if anyone stands up and says, you know, be very careful. The photograph introduces a concept new to us, the lifelike. And once you have the lifelike, you run the risk of life meaning less. And they look at you and they say, you mean you want to abandon photography? Which is absurd. But that's only a reflection of how far technology never gets put to the vote. We never vote on technology. Uh, it just happens. It occurs. We, we vote yet, with our feet. We, we well, adopt it. We adopt it. We find it, we find it useful uh, or entertaining. Um, I, it, you know, the, so light, I think, is, you know, I, I want to I end. With, uh, we can go to questions in one minute, but it, I'm glad you brought up light because I, I think it's one of the great subjects in your books across all of your books is the subject of light, the California light, the light in Monument Valley, the light that Wells and, and Greg Tolan get uh, in Kane, yeah. Citizen Kane uh, and, uh, and, and the Magnificent Ambersons. And the, I, I told you we were preparing for this. I, I watched more or less simultaneously the Magnificent Ambersons and the Earrings of Madame de uh, 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 Max Ophel's movie. And there is things glow in these yeah. movies. They yeah. glow in these movies, and there's they're always in both of, both of their movie, the movies of Max Ophels and, and movies of, of, of Orson Welles. There's always a, a source of light somewhere in the scene that's not directly on or from the actors or or the the sun shining or the uh, ambient light shining on on the actors. And your eye is always drawn to it and drawn to other things that are glowing on the, on, on the screen. It's a really remote, and, and, and you have a comparison at one point, you, you use Las Meninas, the Velazquez painting. And I, I was looking at, at Las Meninas and, and looking at the backgrounds, looking at, 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 at scenes uh, in, in Magnificent Ambersons and, and the earrings of Madame de, and I was thinking, you know, this is really what the painting is about and what both of these filmmakers are, are telling us is there's always light somewhere that we're we're drawn to, and it's always it's always somewhere behind us or around us, uh, or we're using it from some source we don't fully understand. Vermeer, I, I also see this in, in Vermeer, um, and 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 it, it, the trick of the light, if you will, uh, yeah. and and you're very good on 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 this subject. And it's it's something the movies can do for us, and that great art can do for us. Great great painters like Velasquez or Vermeer can do for us that we find very hard to do for ourselves, which is to see the big picture, to see a big screen in which there are many sources of light and 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 energy. There are also incredible motion in both those those films. Um, so before we go to questions, I want to comment on that. Well. I'm looking at, at you in a room in your house. No, no, no. I'm being, I'm being serious. Yeah, I understand. There is a beautiful white light behind you. I, I'm not suggesting that you calculated this or contrived it, but, oh, maybe you did. But when I look at the image of you, your shelf of books going off in a diagonal, a door in the background. I'm not quite sure of the shape of the room behind you, but there is a bright light just over your left shoulder. You may not know it's there, but it is. And it makes, it gives me a sense of how you live that I find really touching. I'm not sentimentalizing you. I find touching and precious. And I think that it's something, as you say, the movies can do. It can put people in a place and it can light them, natural light or artificial light, in a way that says, oh, I think that's a nice guy. And- Okay, okay. Oh. <laughs> I want to get a okay. question from our audience okay. before you, okay. you go into a rapture on 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 this. And it, oh, your and interior design. Yeah, we're, we're friends. <laughs> we're just good friends. Um, uh, Elizabeth, have we got a, a question or two from the audience? We have a wide variety of really great and thoughtful questions. So I'm hoping people can stick on the line a little bit longer so we can okay, get to great. a few of these. Uh, there's a question from Val 
Um, she's writing from the Talman Museum of Art in Roanoke, Virginia, and she says that they'll soon be presenting the uh, Ruth E. Carter Afrofuturism in Costume Design Exhibition, which features this Academy Award winning costume designers creations for movies like Black Panther, Selma, Roots, yeah. Amistad, among others. Um, so she's asking if uh, Crosby or David have any insights as to how costuming black actors has changed over the years. Oh boy, well, that is a fascinating question. Um, well, I mean, you have to allow that for a long time, uh, you did not find black people in American films who were other than very poor. Now, I'm not saying that that wasn't fairly true to life, but I think the constant presentation of black women as housemaids and similar kind of servants, I think it reinforced the idea that that's what black women should be. And, uh, Therefore, they were generally, not always, but generally poorly dressed. And, you know, the world famous scene of Mammy in Gone with the Wind lacing up Scarlett's corset. And Scarlett is from a completely different price level. And, and uh, the maid, Mammy, is helping her. And that seems to be the natural and persistent way in which a black woman and a white woman should interact. Um, I'm sure that the exhibition you're going to mount in Virginia uh, is going to show very, very different situations, and that's all to the good. But it would not be bad, maybe, to show the costumes of a few earlier versions of black people in films. Perhaps you're aiming to do that anyway. But because the contrast is very, very important, I think. I I, I just say what, one thing about it. If if you watch a, a TV show as I have, it's one of my favorite shows, The Good Fight, uh, in which you've got a, essentially a, 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 a black uh, law firm, and the the costuming in that is is pretty fabulous. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, actor, various Audra McDonald, et cetera, wearing etro. I, I know this because I'm married to a, a fashionista, uh, by the way, <laughs> not because I know anything about fashion. Uh, but, uh, you know, and it's pretty spectacular. And I, I think uh, one of the things that has happened in popular culture uh, is the, the African American sense of style, which has always been pretty great, it's just been suppressed or over there somewhere has now blossomed and yeah. it's in the art world I think we, we we know this museums are doing a lot with that I think uh, today it's a spectacular addition that was always there but was ignored or wasn't recognized by by the majority culture uh, and now is and 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 so I, I just want to say you know uh, God bless America that that's happened great Elizabeth another one Yes, indeed. I, I, uh, I'll give you two at once here. Um, first, a comment from Wendy, who says that her online film club has been really popular at the library um, using Canopy, and uh, she loves some suggestions. And then um, the second one from Erica says that pop culture used to exist in a specific time, but now that things are streaming and everything is available right now, outside of the context in which it was made, how do we watch things and acknowledge the difference in society and values? And are we wow. creating the ability, reducing the ability to create new or current pop culture? That's a tough um, question, I think. It's a huge question. Uh, simply, I don't know the answer. I think that, I think that one of the, one of the very important things in home watching is and here's a technology that has changed the world it's the remote so that you're watching tv and you don't like what you're watching so you start thumbing the remote to get to something else and as you do that 
you become like a sort of automatic editing machine of your own TV. And it's enormously interesting to do it because you suddenly get a sense of the multiple versions of the world. And, you know, you cut from an ad to a, a religious program. And if you just go back and forth between the two, they are preaching in not dissimilar ways, but recommending very different things. And I think that using the remote for an hour a day is an enormously educational thing. And I would urge people to do it more. We have hundreds of channels we can look at. Take advantage of that great range. It's all very, all well and good to concentrate on one channel. Obviously, that's the essential way of watching. But the variety that is out there and getting at it can be very instructive about the nature of the world we're living in. So I'd, I'd say you know, it, everything I agree with with what, what what David just said. I, I would say if you're watching something streaming, if you're if you're getting it getting it on your phone or your iPad or or, or on your TV or however you're getting it, um, you're also able to go and take a look at other things on the internet. And I would suggest, you know, I don't always suggest this, but with films I probably would. Wikipedia. Uh, it will give you some context uh, for yeah. uh, for a film, not for everything. I mean, I you know I watched Intolerance on uh, uh, over the last few days because I thought I might be talking about it with David, uh, with the D.W. Griffith film that he made after Birth of a Nation. Um, and I, I watched it on my iPhone actually, which was an experience. It's like like I, I read, read Wordsworth's The Prelude on my iPhone phone at one point, and I, I decided that was not the perfect experience for reading Wordsworth. Um, and it's not the perfect experience for watching Intolerance for sure, um, but it would would have been very helpful for me to have gone, which in fact I did, to uh, uh, some books such as David's books to, to, to look at the context of, of Intolerance, which among other things is two years after Birth of a Nation, which is a purely racist movie. I mean, it is a celebration of the Ku Klux Klan. And Intolerance, of course, is a purely liberal movie about being against intolerance. Um, and you have to understand what D.W. Griffith's very complex uh, uh, background and, and mental state, which is partly a state of, of, the, of the nation at the time and partly a state of his background, um, uh, to, to really understand what's going on in, in that movie. And, and, and also that he might in some, some small way be tried, trying to make amends for, for, for one, of the, one of the worst movies ever made from a racial point of view. It's a brilliant movie from a technological point of view. Uh, it, it's called The Birth of the, of the Art of the Film uh, by, by, by some critics and historians, uh, but it's a purely racist movie, which probably, probably caused some of the racial uh, animosity that led to things like the, the growth of lynchings in the immediate aftermath of the film. Okay, um, so I, uh, I'll, since we're getting close to our time, um, I'll just note an interesting follow-up comment by Ronald, who says that he orders films for his library, and in the past couple of years, he's noticed a decline in DVD circulation in our upscale communities and an increase in other communities, um, and they wow. found that very, interesting. very informative. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I will just uh, close us out. Thank you um, for those of you who have stayed on a couple extra minutes. I will um, not end on a light note and pose one last question for you. This is a, a question from Gladstone who says, um, for a number of reasons, um, maybe growing divisions in our culture writ large, uh, it seems like we're really focused on demystifying the world. So why, if that's the case, is there not an equal creative response during this pandemic, like other seemingly dystopian periods, such as Dog Day Afternoon, Apocalypse Now, or Taxi Driver? How do you think the pandemic um, is, is affecting filmmaking? Um, I don't think it has yet. And I think that that is probably because so many filmmakers, like anyone else, are in a kind of state of shock where getting through, surviving, is very important. But I do think just talking to 
creative people, you find more and more people are discovering aspects of human and social nature during a lockdown that they didn't expect and that is really intriguing. And I think that the kind of new loneliness that COVID has forced upon us, I think that is going to be getting into all the arts and many other aspects of life pretty soon. And, and it would not surprise me that in the next few years, there is a kind of flowering of new, maybe dangerous, but very challenging, interesting ideas in the arts, just as there has to be in society. Uh, I think we probably have to reappraise our whole sense of what we want from police in reality. But a part of that, I think we have to develop a new way of treating police characters in the movies. Because the stereotype of cops in movies has had a lot to do with the more regrettable circumstances in which cops find themselves in reality today. So the two things are very connected. But I do think that, uh, that we could be in for a very rich five or six years or so. And I'm full of hope. Yeah, I, I just uh, say uh, that I, I think one reason we're not seeing so, so much direct response is that we're still, as David said, probably processing it at, at, at some level, but also dealing with it. You know, there was a huge uh, in, in increase in the first few months of the pandemic of people watching uh, pandemic-related movies, you know, the Dustin Hoffman uh, movie, uh, yeah. et, et cetera, and everybody, I admit it, I did it too. Um, and I was reading the books about, I was going back, you know, to, to The Last Man by Mary Shelley and, and uh, Di uh, Diary of the Plague Year, uh, Journal of the Plague Year, et cetera. Um, I've stopped doing that. Now I'm, you know, now I'm watching uh, uh, All Creatures Great and Small because uh, I, I want to get away from the, the, the disaster. Um, I, I think you'll, you'll probably see some, some, some really interesting and epic work before, uh, before too long about what, what's happened. And, and I think one thing that has happened in the pandemic, and, and David alluded to this, um, and we might have a little bit of a disagreement about how it happens and how we, how we deal with it, uh, but the social justice effects of the pandemic or injustice effects of the pandemic reveal something about the way we structure our, our society. And I think you'll you'll see commentary on that from the world of the arts and humanities. And I think you'll see government uh, uh, and institutions like libraries and museums try to deal with that. So well, Elizabeth, thank you so much. We do. And and uh, special thanks to, to you, Crosby, for hosting such a, a riveting discussion. And uh, thank you very much, David, for joining us. It was a, a really engaging. I want to thank everyone who helped put this together. Bubble Crosby, who is an old friend, and and um, we often disagree. And disagreement is a very, very important aspect of conversation. And I want to say one one last thing, which is it may be that the movies, in more ways than one, have gotten small, but our film critic is always <laughs> big. <laughs> And so with that, a fun, a fun farewell to the movies Good night. Today. Good luck. Good night. Thanks, Good everyone. Luck. We'll be Thanks. ending the broadcast. You can find this on imls.gov afterward. Take care. <laughs>